Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our third part of the series of webinars related to pharmaceutical application. This webinar today is entitled with investigating thermal stability and shelf life of pharmaceuticals by using TG FTIR coupling techniques. And I would like to start with some remarks regarding the techniques themselves. Prior to that, I would like to introduce myself very briefly. My name is Eckhard Füglein. I'm working at the Applications Laboratory at Netsch headquarter here in Selb in Germany. And as I mentioned, I would like to start with introducing the techniques. TGFTIR is a combination of a thermogravimetrical analyzer and spectroscopic techniques. So this means, first of all, we have to, to deal with thermogravimetry. All techniques in thermal analysis are standardized methods. And for the definition of thermogravimetry, I selected the expression which is found in ASTM E473. So that describes a technique that records mass changes as a function of temperature while the substance is subjected to a controlled temperature program, which is always the case for some analytical techniques. The equipment is called thermal balance and the recorded parameters are mass loss or mass gain. The abbreviations which are used is TGA for thermogravimetric analysis. So that includes not only the measurement, but also the evaluation and interpretation of the data. And the technique as such is TG thermogravimetry. There are different types of balance systems existing. The oldest one, found in several millenniums before Christ already is the classical hang down system where the balance arm or balance beam is on top and the samples or, or the reference sample and reference are hanging on this balance arm. There is another technique which is commonly used, used nowadays, which is called a top loading balance system. And there is also an, a system with an horizontal balance arm where the balance is on one side and the sample at the other side. I would like to focus today on this type of balance because all the balances we produce are top loading balances. And just to, to give you a brief idea about the equipments. So that's our TG209 F1 Nivio which has two magazines for samples here, because this is a system showing an automatic sample change. You can see the gripper here. The balance is underneath, about this position. The furnace would be in here, and this is already the cover of the furnace, which is removed to exchange samples. There's another balance system, um, TG209 F3 Nivio, which is the work horse for applications up to 1000 degrees, whereas the TG209F1 goes up to 1100 degrees, which is by far enough for all organic matter, food, polymers, pharmaceutical application, for instance. In order to answer the question how thermogravimetric analysis is helpful to study thermal stability, I would like to show a typical thermogravimetric result. The results of the, the mass change over temperature is scaled here on the left side in relative figures. Usually in relative figures, you can also choose the absolute units in microgram or milligram. This is then scaled over temperature. And here on the right side, we see a scale for the change of mass, so the first derivative of the, the mass change gives us the rate of mass change, which is then also given in percent per minute. If we follow this black line here from room temperature up to 
around about 600 degrees, we can see that the sample in this example is not changing its mass up to at least 380 degrees C. Then we can detect a mass change, and that is what makes thermal balance very important, is that we can quantify, of course, this mass change. And so in this example, it is the, the thermal degradation or decomposition of polyethylene, which starts with this uh, extrapolated onset construction. I will come to this topic later again at 455 degrees. And then we have a complete gasification of the material. The residual mass is zero, indicated by this 100% of mass loss. So this is a very typical result. And in order to summarize all the information we can gain from a thermogravimetric measurement, um, it is first of all the temperature up to which there is no mass change. I will come back especially to this topic again because this is then related to thermal stability. The temperature indicating the beginning of the event is, is this one here. It is evaluated with a tangent construction from the, the, the zero line, the baseline here, and from a tangent which is um, constructed from the inflection point of the TG. And this intersection here is called the extrapolated onset, which refers to the beginning of the decomposition. Then we can, call, of course, quantify the mass change. We have the residual mass, and of course, we have also this inflection point here is even more clearly indicated with the first derivative. So the maximum of the first derivative, the maximum of the mass loss rate, the temperature where the decomposition reaction is fast, the fastest is usually used to describe the mass loss. This is summarized here again. So what we can detect is the, the mass change, the rate of mass change, which is the first derivative, the DTG peak, this is this temperature I was mentioning just a few seconds ago. And of course, this one here, the T temperature onset of the decomposition, which is then rate later related to thermal stability. How thermogrammetry or thermal analysis in general is used in uh, pharmaceutical applications is defined in pharmacopoeias from different countries. I selected here the US version, which defines thermal analysis as measurement techniques to detect chemical and physical property changes as a function of temperature. This we have already seen. And then it refers to information we can obtain from thermogravimetric analysis like crystal perfection, polymorphism, melting temperature, sublimation, glass transition, and so on. I highlighted the ones which are related to thermogravimetric techniques because this is a general one related to thermal analysis and so related to um, also to DSC and other techniques. So dehydration, for instance, is a typical example for the information uh, studied with thermogravimetry evaporation, pyrolysis. I will define pyrolysis and combustion and decomposition later on a little bit more in detail. And they are these parameters or these results are used to, um, to study stability of materials, thermal stability we are especially focusing on today. There is pharmacopoeia also in other countries. In Japan, in, in Japan, uh, thermogravimetry can also be used for the loss on drying. The water content is usually studied with a technique which is called Carl Fischer. But loss of drying is also something that uh, refers to thermogravimetric techniques, as we can see from the US version here. So the loss on drying can also be recorded with a um, thermal balance. Regarding thermal stability, I already mentioned that. Um, also, this one is defined in, in an ASTM standard, which says that um, the thermal stability is given with a temperature 
up to which the material is not decomposing. And of course, it's also referred to the related mass change, but in fact, the stability itself is the temperature until the material is not changing its composition. And it's not evolving gas. So that's what we mainly measure with a thermogravimetric device. If the sample remains inside the crucible or if it starts decomposing, producing gases, and then the gases are purged out of the system and um, the sample would lose weight. So from this point of view, the thermal stability is defined as the temperature up to which the composition is not changing and therefore the mass of the, the sample is not changing. As an example, how decisive the atmosphere in this uh, with these measurements is, I selected one example where I plotted the mass change um, of sodium styrene fumarate versus time in this case. You can see the temperature line here and the scale for the temperature here on the right. If we thermally treat this material in nitrogen atmosphere, we can see um, uh, a small mass loss step here and then the decomposition behavior starting at around about 25 minutes. If we would do the same kind of experiment, not in nitrogen, where it is called a pyrolysis, but in oxidizing atmosphere, then of course it's not a pyrolysis anymore but a combustion reaction and this is completely different as you can see here with the red line. The release here is somehow uh, the same which is most probably due to the release of humidity of the sample. I will have another example later showing this more clear. That samples can lose humidity at comparably low temperature. But referring to the atmosphere, you can see that the, decom the decomposition behavior is completely different. Pyrolysis has a, a longer thermal stability and then a, um, a much slower mechanism of decomposition. Whereas if oxygen is present, the combustion reaction is much faster and producing a lot of energy since it is exothermic. One possibility to prove if balances are um, supporting the, the right atmosphere, so if we want to do a pyrolysis, we have to avoid oxygen, as you can see from this example. A good material to test if the thermal balance is really tight and um, serving for pure oxygen-free atmospheres during the measurement we can use an inorganic material called copper oxalate. If we treat this material, um, then it starts decomposing, forming um, elemental copper in a very fine dis uh, powder size. So the, the particles are very small. And as you can see, carbon dioxide is released. So this mass loss step is, release, is related to the carbon dioxide release. And latest at 350, we have very fine, small particle size copper particles, which are very reactive against oxygen. So if the, the balance is perfectly tight, you can see with the red line, the atmosphere is clean. There is no mass gain because of the oxida oxidation of the copper. So we have used pure nitrogen atmosphere um, and evacuated the system and refilled it with pure nitrogen prior to the measurement in order to clean the atmosphere. If this is not done like this, but um, the system is just purged with nitrogen, even if nitrogen is of a, of a very high quality and very pure, you can see that there, are, at this, in this case, there is a slight mass increase of around about 1% up to 500 and maybe another percent up to maximum temperature, which is caused by the copper oxidation. So if the metal is oxidized, then of course we produce the copper oxide and the copper oxide is a solid material inside the crucible, which is of course heavier than the pure copper particles. So that's a good test to, um, to see if the thermogravimetrical analyzer is offering a pure atmosphere to the sample. 
which has a significant influence on the decomposition mechanism, as I showed in the example before. Thermal stability is usually investigated with uh, common measurement parameters, like in the examples before. 10 Kelvin per minute is a very common heating rate. The gas flow rate is usually kept a constant, 20, 40 milliliters per minute. But the heating rate can change, and this will also have an influence on the result. So if you want to compare measurement results, we should always have a look at the measurement conditions. Only if they are identical, then the results will be comparable. Changing heating rates is a very common technique, especially for kinetic evaluation. So then the, the time temperature correlation is given by making three, four, five tests with different heating rates. Okay, and another example, renatidine is a pharmaceutical ingredient for the control of gast gastritic acid production or heartburn or also for the treatment of reflux diseases. You can see the measurement parameters given here below. The result is showing the, the TG result over temperature. And the dashed line here refers to the rate of mass change. Since we are especially interested in thermal stability, so we have a um, particular look at the beginning of the measurement, starting at room temperature. You can see that the material is not changing its mass up to 160 degrees, roughly. And then we have a two-step decomposition mechanism. To summarize a little bit the uh, information we can gain from thermogravimetric measurements, I made a list here, starting with thermal stability, which is the focus today. And we will see later how we can also make use of the spectroscopic techniques in order to identify the released gases. So thermal stability is, of course, related to degradation or decomp decombustion. I already pointed out that the atmosphere is of importance in order to distinguish between pyrolysis and combustion, for instance. So combustion reactions are then, of course, related to the oxidative stability. And especially for, for polymers or for sample mixtures uh, consisting of organic and inorganic material. So a very good example would be a polymer being reinforced with glass fiber, for instance. You can also make a compositional analysis by burning the, the organic matter and uh, making a, a ratio between organic and inorganic because the glass fiber um, reinforcement will remain inside the crucible at the end of the measurement, whereas the organic material is completely burned. With respect to impurities, it's also possible to identify um, via a mass change signal if there is a, re a residual amount of solvent uh, still absorbed at the surface of a, of a powder sample, for instance, or humidity if the, the sample is hygroscopic, which is then related to the interaction with the environment, with the lab atmosphere, for instance, if the material absorbs humidity on the surface. It's possible with changing heating rates and thermal treatment to simulate processes, processing of the material. And also, as I mentioned already, it's possible to use different heating rates, for example, in order to get an idea about the kinetics of the decomposition behavior. So this is the information we can gain from thermogravimetric devices. We would all like to enlarge this, this knowledge by using a, a second technique. Thermogravimetric analysis and um, thermal analysis techniques in general are more descriptive methods. So the list you can see here describes chemical and physical property changes of a material. We insert the sample, we heat the material, and we describe if and how the material is changing with temperature and time. This is usually not ending up with a chemical identification of the materials used, but this can be done by the combination of a thermogravimetric device with a spectroscopic technique, especially FTIR is usually used for organic material. 
So this is um, um, an overview on how we identify material with the different techniques. So using thermogravimetry gives us the information about thermal stability, as we already have seen, the quantification of mass loss, the residual mass, and, and all these parameters. With an extension that is uh, related to DTA signals, it's also possible to detect uh, melting behavior. We will see one example later. And we can make use of an additional uh, software tool, which is called Identify, which is comparing the TG results with data or results stored in a library in order to get an idea about the, the origin of the material. So that's, again, the TG part. If we in, combine the TG equipment with spectroscopic techniques, especially FTIR, then we can extract the spectra at a certain temperature. So we detect spectra over the whole, during the whole measurement. And we can then, of course, detect the gas phase of the, um, or the, the, the gases which are released from the sample using the same strategy via a similarity comparison of the measured spectra to gas spectra stored in a library. And the idea is, of course, to identify the, the gases which are released from the sample. I will show you now a, a picture of such a combination, or two different combinations. You can see, for instance, a thermal balance here. This is the view from, from top. You can see the, the magazines with all the crucibles, 96 crucibles per magazine. This is the gripper again. This would be the position where the the, the furnace is located and the balance underneath. And as you can see, there is directly on top a spectrometer mounted. So it's a direct coupling connection from the exhaust pipe of the TG into the gas compartment of the FTIR. So this means the gases are very quickly transferred to the FTIR in order to be analyzed. So this means we can make use of all the parameters we already discussed uh, which we gain from the TG experiment. And now we can also ad additionally analyze the gases which are released. And in the lower picture here, you can see another combination, again, using uh, the TG 209F1 Nevio, now connected to two gas anal analyzing systems. You can see the adapter here. The heated adapter is on one hand side, on the left side here, um, sending the gases to an external gas box, which is connected to a regular standard uh, Bruker 10 or 2. Natch and Bruker has uh, more than 25 years uh, cooperation for this coupling systems. And on the other hand, there is a connection with a very fine capillary to a mass spectrometer, which is shown here on the right side. Since the mass spectrometer is using a very, very tiny amount of gas and all the rest of the gas goes to the gas cell of the FTIR, which is operated at ambient pressure, there is no compromise in data quality if we connect both of the systems at the same time. So we can gain the information about the thermogravimetric analyzer, the FTIR, and the mass spectrometer at the same time. And I would like to show some examples now how topogravimetric analyzers connected to spectrometers are, can, uh, can be useful for pharmaceutical studies. So the first example I would like to show is aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid, as you know, most probably very widely used. If you treat um, Acetyl salicylic acid uh, up to 600 degrees. The result of the thermogravimetric um, measurement is shown here, starting at 100%. So this is the initial sample mass. All the parameters are again given here below the plot. We will find uh, a two-step decomposition mechanism. The first step up to 220 degrees shows a mass loss of 33.3. And the second mass loss step, another 61% of mass loss. And now, of course, it would be interesting to know the mechanism of decomposition and the gases which are released. 
Therefore, we have a look at all the spectra which are collected during this measurement. So in parallel to the TG, we record also the, the FTIR spectra, and they are summarized in this three-dimensional cube. This is actually the starting of the measurement since this is room temperature. You can see a temperature scale here. That's the set scale is a an, an temperature scale. All the spectra which are collected during the measurement are um, referring to this wave numbers here. So this is the energetic scale and the intensity is scaled to the top. You can also see the, the course of the TG measurement here in the rear phase. And now the idea is, is of course to extract single spectra uh, along these cursor positions, for instance, in order to identify the gases which are released during the first and second mass loss step. So therefore we, we extract at maximum intensity of the first mass loss step a single spectra spectrum and we compare this to library data, to spectra which are shown in, in spectra libraries. So this is the extracted spectrum at 180 degrees. You can see this in red. And the comparison of uh, with the library spectrum of acetic acid. This is shown in black. It is a pretty good comparison, but there are still some absorbance intensities which do not match to the library spectrum of acetic acid. So this means there are additional gases released which cannot be explained with the spectrum of acetic acid. And I marked the positions here. You can see here is a mismatch, here is a mismatch, and here and here. So all the rest is pretty pretty good comparable. So now the, the question is, what is the chemical substance referring to, to these intensities? And therefore, I have shown an additional library spectrum for salicylic acid, which matches pretty well to the, to the missing absorbance intensities. So this means at 180 degrees, it's very likely that acetic acid and salicylic acid is produced which gives us information about um, the, the chemical mechanism of decomposition of this material. And so we can try to, to, uh, um, to make a, a reaction scheme for the decomposition of salicylic acid, forming salicylic acid and acetic acid. And I would like to especially focus on the temperatures of melting, the fusion temperature and the evaporation temperature or decomposition temperature. So this means this chemical is melting at 136 degrees. And shortly after that, it starts to evaporate or decompose. And the products which are built do already melt, the salicylic acid, for instance, do, does already melt at 159 degrees and starts to evaporate latest at 211. And the other material which is released is already gaseous at that temperature where it is released. So this means it is not a surprise that acetic acid can be found as a major component. And if we continue heating, we will also find salicylic acid in increasing concentration. So we, I would like to, to try to keep these temperatures in mind. So the, the green dot here is referring to the melting temperature of the starting material, the um, acetyl, 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 acetyl salicylic acid, and the salicylic acid melting temperature is shown here in blue, and the evaporation temperature in red. I will try to mark this later on on a... Um, TG result and salicylic acid is supposed to further decompose. I tried to sum up this in this uh, chemical equation. So if we treat salicylic acid further on with temperature, it starts to decompose and produce phenol and carbon dioxide. And again, the products are supposed to be already gaseous at this temperature. So coming back to, to the TG result, so if we would like to, to get more information from it, we first of all calculate the first derivative, which is the DTG shown in green here, in order to refer to the maximum uh, mass loss rate for each of the mass loss steps. So this would be actually the temperature 
to cut the single spectrum from the three-dimensional cube. And there is already an information about the intensity changes of FTIR, which can be implemented into, into the thermogravimetric software, which is the so-called Gram-Schmidt trace. So this is kind of an integral over all intensity changes. So this means as, as soon as the absorbance intensity, um, if the gas which is released from the sample is interacting with the infrared beam, we see uh, an increase here, so an increase in, in the absorbance intensities. It's just telling us that the gases are interacting with the infrared beam. It's not giving us any information yet which kind of gas it is. So therefore, we have to, to go back to the infrared uh, data and compare this with library data, as we already did. And I, I try to um, indicate the melting temperature of the starting material by making use of this calculated DTA signal, which I already introduced before. So this means this is the, the temperature where the sample starts to melt and immediately after melting, it's, it starts to evaporate as we can see. So at, this is the starting point for the decomposition. This is the evaporation temperature of the starting material um, shown with the, uh, with the blue one. And this is the evaporation temperature of the product, one of the product, the uh, salicylic acid. So this means during the decomposition of the starting material, we bypass the temperature where the product is evaporating. So that's the reason why there is not a, a plateau um, visible and the mass loss continues because the, the product, salicylic acid, immediately continues to evaporate. That's an explanation why we do not see a, a, a totally separated, uh, two separated mass loss steps in this case. Now the question which is still not answered is which kind of gases are released during the second mass loss step. And as I mentioned, we usually refer to the maximum intensity in FTIR, which fits pretty well to the maximum intensity, maximum mass loss rate. So please keep in mind that this is the first derivative of the TG, which is of course detected inside the thermogravimetrical analyzer. And this one here, this intensity maximum is the maximum of the infrared. So this is already detected inside the infrared system. And five degrees of a difference is less than half a minute uh, transfer time, by the way. So the red spectrum again now shows, this is indicated with a black dot here, shows the, the spectrum for the second mass loss step at 360 degrees compared to the library spectrum of salicylic acid. And as you can see, it fits pretty well for almost all the absorbance intensities except this one here, which is exactly the absorbance intensity related to carbon dioxide. And we already concluded that further thermal treatment of salicylic acid would produce um, phenol and carbon dioxide. In order to get an idea about the temperature dependent release of the, diff to the two main decomposition products like ac acetic acid and salicylic acid, um, I showed this library spectra for both pure materials, acetic acid shown in red and salicylic acid shown in green. So if you would like to get an idea about the, the speed of mass loss per individual chemical, you would ha have to refer to absorbance intensities which do not overlap. So I selected this one here around about uh, 1480 wave numbers representing salicylic acid and almost no contribution of um, acetic acid. and on the other hand, this is the only absorbance intensity which is mainly due to the acetic acid and only very slightly due to the salicylic acid. So if we calculate the intensity over time and temperature for these absorbance intensities and take back this information into the original plot, then we can get an idea about the, the release. I try to, to highlight these tr so-called traces here in the three-dimensional plot again. I hope you can see the, the green line here, um, which shows the insolvent intensities, which is this one here at the, at the rear face. And this is the absorbance intensity for the acetic acid. So the green line here would be the, the absorbance intensities integrated for um, um, salicylic acid. And the red one here is the intensity integrated for the trace of 
acetic acid. And taking these traces back to the uh, original plot, we can see, first of all, the, the mass change again. Second, the Gram-Schmidt trace, which I introduced as kind of an integral, summing up all the individual contributions of all the absorbance intensities. And if we would like to identify the individual um, compounds by intensity, you can see these traces shown uh, for acetic acid with a red dashed line. And, you, and this shows that this is the major contribution to the first mass loss step. No contribution from carbon dioxide, which is the black line here, and a few uh, amount of salicylic acid, as we have already seen. The first spectrum was a mixture from acetic acid and salicylic acid. And you can see nicely that salicylic acid intensities do not go back to zero again. So this was the reason uh, why there is no plateau in between, no separation between the mass loss steps, because the salicylic acid immediately starts to evaporate as soon as it is spilled. And therefore, the intensity increases here for the second mass loss step again. And the spectrum which we extracted at this temperature was showing intensities for salicylic acid, as you remember, and carbon dioxide. So calculating the traces for each individual uh, compound can, can nicely give information about the decomposition mechanism and the identification of the compounds being released. And as you have seen from the chemical equation, it gives us a feedback and an idea about uh, the chemical mechanism. The next example is uh, Nepaijin, which is a material um, for, um, which is, uh, a, first of all, it is a um, para or four hydroxybenzoic acid ester, methyl ester. And this material is also known as methyl parabene. And you can see the TG and DDG course here. Now the TG is shown as a closed green line and you can see the Gram-Schmidt trace in with a black line and you can see that there are two intensities, maximum intensities, so this means it is not a single step uh, um, mechanism and even so the material completely decomposes. You, you can see that, the, that there is a hundred percent of mass loss and no mass no of nothing of the original initial sample mass is left at the end now again when being interested in the compounds being released from this material we would refer to the individual spectra at these temperatures and if we would be um, interested in the thermal stability we would have a focus on the on on the beginning of this mechanism so I have used um, a zoom out here. So the, this gray box here at the beginning of the decomposition um, is enlarged here. You can see latest at 100 degrees, the decomposition starts. And referring to the spectra to identify the, the gases which are released, we do the same procedure as already described. So we have the wave numbers here, the temperature scale here, the temperature program, uh, the, the measured te sample temperature, in fact. And here in the rear face, you see the, the more or less single step mass loss. We have seen that there are two um, maxima with high intensities in the infrared and cutting um, uh, individual spectrum from both of the temperatures 216 and 230. Um, we can see that both of these spectra are identical. So this means the gases which are released during this um, mass loss step are not changing over temperature. This is a nice indication um, for a mechanism which is, is not forming new chemical structures or which is in fact not a decomposition. 
So the proof for this is then, of course, given by a comparison with library data. So as I already mentioned, uh, this structure um, is a 4-hydroxybenzoic acid ester. Since the material, which is a methyl ester, is not available in a, a gas phase library, I selected um, a derivate, um, a pentyl ester, which is very similar, but not identical, of course. And we can also refer to another database. So this library comparison was done with a spectrum library, um, which is commercially available from, from Bruca. And this one is taken from a NIST chemistry web book. And you can see that this is exactly the material we started with. And both the fact that the spectrum, the absorbance intensities over temperature is not changing, and the fact, of course, that this is the same material as the starting material nicely confirms that this is not a decomposition. It's not a degradation of the material. It's not forming new chemicals. Therefore, it's, it's an evaporation. It's simply an evaporation. So we gasify the original material. The molecule remains as it is and can be detected in the gas phase. The next example is uh, potassium uh, cluvulinate. This is a material from the penicillin groups, antibiotics. And it is, um, it is uh, uh, known as being very hygroscopic. So it, now the thermal stability is of a, a special interest. It's not only thermal stability, it's also the fact how this material uptakes water. And you can see from the, the TG result that even so the material was claimed to be dry and taken fresh from, from the, the sealed bottle. Even so, there is a very tiny mass loss up to 150 degrees uh, of 1.8 percent, which is then most probably related to humidity. And when continue heating the material to higher temperatures, you can see that in total it's four mass loss steps um, showing this the degradation of the material. For thermal stability, or especially uh, for the focus on um, at what temperature the humidity is released, we can make a zoom to the low temperature range and have a, a particular look to this um, tiny mass loss step. And you can see that this already starts at around about 60 degrees. And this is something we should we should keep in mind that the release temperature of gases is related to the binding force or the force with with which the material is fixed at or in the at the powder or inside the structure so depending on if it is a, a crystal water which is really used inside the crystal structure or if the humidity is absorbed on the surface this makes a difference in the release temperature and usually at temperatures even below 100 degrees, it is a clear indication that, this, that the, the gas which is released here was just absorbed at the surface. So the, the release temperature is somehow related to energy, to the, to the binding strengths and force with which the material is fixed inside the structure or absorbed in, in case of fusi and chemisorption uh, at the surface. So to prove that this is um, this mass loss is due to um, to water, we can make a, a comparison with the spectrum at this temperature, and this is very typical for for surface water. At higher temperatures, we make a comparison of the extracted spectrum with a library spectrum of carbon dioxide, and we see that this is the main compound which is released at 190 degrees. Since I told you that this material is somehow hygroscopic, it is interesting to see if the storage conditions would have an influence on, on the behavior of the material. So that's why we, we used a setup like this, having the substance in a, in a, in a vessel, putting this inside a, a closed container, which is partially filled with water, 
in order to expose the material to humidity for a different different period of time, so for one and for two weeks. And if we then take the sample and do another TG experiment, we can see that this is clearly different compared to the so-called dry version before. You can see that the, at comparably low temperature, there is a huge mass loss step, which is now related to the to the uptake and humidity. And you can also see that this is completely changing the decomposition mechanism because this mass loss step here almost disappeared completely. And then the further treatment uh, or the first the further mass loss step seems to be somehow comparable. But at the beginning, uh, the material changed completely. And um, this is the comparison between the dry sample shown here in green and the sample which was taken after one week of storage in humid atmosphere. This is showing a zoom out of the previous picture and you can see this even more clear that this second mass loss step here is not detectable anymore. So there is not only an uptake in humidity, it's obviously a change of the of the structure as well. So it's it's very likely that the reason for this is a, a chemical reaction, in fact, with the with the water. This is a further comparison, taking a second sample after two weeks of storage. You can see that this is even more tremendous. Um, you can see the the mass loss step increased to 58%. So it's an even more um, intense change of of the uh, chemistry with the storage of uh, in humid atmosphere making the story complete we refer to the to the infrared data the dry material the material stored after one week you can see the difference here this is the uh, the red line here indicates the maximum intensities for water release which was not visible here this is the picture before the dry material at 100 you can see the this is more or less at close to 100 degrees the water signal and a very similar picture after the storage of two weeks in humid atmosphere another remarkable result is that after the storage in humid atmosphere the decomposition obviously also started at much lower temperature so we if you compare this to the dry version um, at 119 degrees the material which was stored in humid atmosphere already starts to decompose indicated by the signal of carbon dioxide which was found already at 120 degrees uh, whereas the material in in dry atmosphere just started at around about 200 with the decomposition and the production of carbon dioxide as a comparison. So that's a clear indication that um, storage conditions like humidity may have a, a significant influence on the shelf life and, and the, the lifetime of the material. So I would like to summarize a little bit what I tried to point out today. Thermogravimetric analysis is first of all to detect mass loss and to evaluate this mass loss signals quantitatively. And it's therefore a very good technique in order to study thermal stability of materials, organic materials in, uh, in particular like pharmaceutical samples but also food or polymers i try to to point out that the combination of a descriptive technique like thermogravimetry and an identifying spectroscopic technique like ftir is very helpful in order to get even more information about the decomposition behavior tg delivers as as i uh, explained the thermal stability the temperature of mass loss, the quantification of the mass loss steps, and also the residual mass, which can, could be very helpful in order to find a good explanation for the decomposition mechanism. And the FTIR data at different temperatures can give a very good indication which kind of gases are released and therefore being very helpful in order to, to find the right decomposition mechanism. 
I also try to point out that the atmosphere is of uh, importance. So I would like to remind you to that inert gas atmosphere is usually ending up with a pyrolysis mechanism and oxy oxygen inside the material inside the atmosphere makes it a, a decomposition which is called combustion because since the material is burning with oxygen there is there is one um, exception FTIR is not helpful for so-called homonuclear diatomic molecules like oxygen itself nitrogen hydrogen chlorine fluorine and also the noble gases since they are not changing its dipole when interacting with the infrared light but this is very often not a disadvantage but more an advantage because then you don't have any contribution of the purge gas since nitrogen and air synthetic air oxygen we are very often using as a purge gas inside the thermogravimetrical analyzer so then we have the results being exclusively related to the gases released from the sample and not from the carrier gas or purge gas so I hope I could show you that it's possible to distinguish between uh, gaseous molecules such as water or humidity being absorbed at the surface or built in the crystal structure. And of course, it would also be possible to, to see if, there, if the material is a solvate or if residual amounts of solvates uh, are absorbed on the surface of the powder. And of course, it's also possible to, um, to make kinetic evaluation, especially with the new Kinetics Neo software from Natch, which will be introduced in another webinar, of course. Predictions for long-term stability can then be done and um, even for periods of time which are not accessible in thermogravimetric measurements. And this can also be of importance in order to to make up uh, material properties such as self uh, shelf life behavior. I would like to use this opportunity to point out that there is a fourth part of this webinar series related to pharmaceutical application being entitled with how fully automatic software routines can actively support users in the evaluation of some analytical curves. So this will be the upcoming webinar. And of course, we would be happy to welcome you also to the fourth part of this webinar series. I would like to thank you very much for your interest, for being with us for this webinar today. And I would like to use the opportunity at the at the end of this webinar to answer your questions if you have some so you can make use of the the chat function to ask questions and in case I should not be able to ask answer all the questions today I would like to uh, take the opportunity to send the answers via email so please feel free to ask questions through this chat functionality. And since I cannot see, I will wait a, um, a few minutes more. But in case you should have questions later on, please feel free to send them also via email. You have all the contact data available. Since there are um, no questions up to now, I would like to take the opportunity to thank you once again for your, for your interest and being with us. And I hope to see you also for the upcoming fourth part of the webinar series related on pharmaceuticals. Thank you very much. <laughs>